Hey everybody, in this video what we're going to cover is part 11 of our series on JASP and we're going to break this into two parts. The first part we're going to cover is simple linear regression. So I'm going to go over kind of the ins and outs of regression here at the beginning and talk about both of them. And then we'll break the video into two parts so it's not so long and we'll cover simple regression and then multiple regression. So you can just get the half you need. Right. So let's get started. We moved from correlation and now we're going to go into regression. The good thing about thinking about correlation first and then going into regression is that simple linear regression is correlation. Right? A lot of the pieces and parts are the same except now we're going to force one of them to be the predictor. So we're going to say that one of them is the, the reason why something happens. Okay, we won't use cause here, we're going to use predictor because depending on how you run your study, that will change whether or not you can say cause. But, you know, I know that smoking probably causes cancer, but we can't ethically make people smoke to test this theory. So instead we just say smoking predicts cancer. Right? And that's the purpose of regression over correlation. We're using the word predict versus related. All right, so a simple linear regression finds that linear relationship using one of them as the predictor, and one of them often called the criterion or dependent variable. Um, and it might also become the outcome, the target. It's the variable we're trying to predict. Okay. Uh, sometimes this is called bivariate linear regression because there's uh, one predictor and one outcome. But in order to run a simple linear regression, we need two continuous variables. One independent variable is continuous and one dependent variable is continuous. Now you can actually run a linear regression with one variable, the independent variable as categorical, but then you're doing ANOVA. So you might as well go back and just do the ANOVA. ANOVA is just a special case of regression. Okay, it's, it's a, a cousin, a friend of regression. Mathematically, they're actually very similar. Okay, if not the same, depending on what you're doing. Um, so generally we kind of save regression for continuous IVs and continuous DVs, because if we have a categorical IV and a continuous DV, people prefer often to do the ANOVA version because it's a little bit easier to walk through those steps. Okay. Maybe it's not easier, it's more traditional to walk through those steps. But uh, do know you can use categorical predictors, you're not like prohibited. Um, we're just going to focus on the cases where you have continuous predictors. So what might you do a simple linear regression for? Okay. Over correlation, the main key point to doing regression instead of correlation is prediction. Okay. You want to predict. So I want to take some independent variable and predict new values. Okay. And um, this might be that you, uh, you know, you have some scores, this example from, from the notes here, you have some scores of people's results from last semester and you want to predict their score, someone's score for this semester. Okay, so I can use that equation to help predict what the how they might perform. Uh, I can determine how much variation in the dependent variables explained by the independent variable, and this will look hopefully familiar. It's r squared, right? So how much of the dependent variable can I predict? Because our DVs have variability, right? We looked at the distributions of them. We think about how they vary. Can I predict when they vary? And how much of that can I predict when they vary? Okay. And generally, these two kind of pieces here work also for multiple regression. But when you're looking at the, the output, this maps onto the kinds of things that are in the output. So can I predict new values? Is there... Um, can basically that question can I predict new values or that would be the overall regression equation and then how much can I predict those values we can look at an r squared value and there's even one more question not yet answered sort of here is what is a good predictor so that's answered more with multiple regression so multiple regression like its name implies allows us to do multiple continuous or mixed IVs and one, one dependent variable. So in all of these analyses for this course, generally you stick with one dependent variable because when you move up to more dependent variables, it becomes advanced. Okay. 
that model here, and I think it probably would be better if we also explain the model a little bit up here. Okay, so let's see, where can we put that model? Let's add this here, because I think that helps see what's going on. So a simple linear regression, right, has a predictive equation. So actually, you know what? Well, okay, we've got predicts down here. We'll be all right. So predictive equation where we're trying to understand how to predict people's scores. Okay, and then we're going to move some of this stuff. up higher because I think it's useful to think about them individually oh, and then the multiple version. All right, so here we've got y, and this really should be considered y hat. Let's see if I can fix that bad boy in a little bit, but y hat here is the predicted score of a participant given their x uh, score. Okay. So it's your prediction of what they're gonna make on this biochemical exam, given their X variable, whatever that is, right? B0, and that's just B0, we're not going with beta just yet. B0, or sometimes called B0, which just makes me laugh, is also known as the constant in the equation. Okay? And that constant, is often the y, or is called the y-intercept. It's not often the y-intercept, it is the y-intercept. Okay. <clears throat> so this is the intercept, uh, also known as the constant, y-intercept, okay, this is the mean of y when x is zero. Okay. B1 here, okay. you can also do beta, we're just gonna stick with B, our unstandardized equation, that'll make a little more sense in a bit. Get some wild formatting going on right here. It's all is known as the slope parameter for x1 okay. and more if there are more of them. But at the moment, we only have one. So, what the heck is a slope? Well, the slope parameter represents the increase that we get given the increase in x. So, for every one unit increase. In X, we get B unit increases in Y. And a great example of this is a project that we did many years ago. We were trying to predict people's final grades. Okay, so Y here, or Y hat, is your score in the course. And we were measuring your attendance at extra tutorials. Okay, so we used supplemental instruction, which is a pretty famous program that allows people to basically get free help in a course. People hold sessions each week. Okay. This is very popular for things like organic chemistry and bio to help pre-med students perform better in courses that are traditionally pretty difficult. Okay. And so what we measured was the number of sessions they went to to just show how much better their grade could get. Okay. So here what we'd see is for every one session they went to, they would get 0.05 increases in Y. And that doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that that means that for every 10 sessions, that's like once a week in a normal semester, you know, give or take breaks, for every one set of 10 sessions they went to, they got a half a letter grade better on their final grade. Some of these courses offer 30 or more sessions, so for every 20 sessions, their grade increased an entire letter grade. And so when you get to explaining things like that, it helps people see the purpose of, of regression. This last piece here is E, or the errors. Okay. Uh, epsilon here, which uh, we've seen before in some other videos, represents the error term. Okay. We don't predict everyone's score perfectly. We might, then the error would be zero. But if we don't have their score quite right, what we'll do is um, say, well, here's how wrong we're getting it. And those error terms are gonna be pretty important here in a little bit. All right, now let's come back to this one, the multiple regression. We'll keep using epsilon here. So in multiple regression, we move from having one B and one X 
to multiple B's and multiple X's. Okay. And what that does is it allows me to uh, think about having multiple predictors at once. So in our example of supplemental instruction, it might be also just the previous GPA of a student. Okay. So some students are A students and some students are C students. And so we could control for the fact that we had different levels of performance naturally. So in our equation, we might see that we had uh, how many sessions they attended and their previous GPA as our two predictors. Okay. And then once you control for that, it gets even better for sessions. So it, the scores move up. So it uh, shows us that after we adjust for students' uh, initial grades, what we see is that the sessions help even more. And that allows me to think about the relative contribution of each predictor. So knowing how much the sessions matter given their previous scores and knowing how much their previous scores matter given the number of sessions. Now both of these require the assumption of linearity between the independent variable and the dependent variable. And when you have multiple variables, the composite of all of those variables um, together, right? So the combination, the linear combinations of each of the multiple variables. Okay. So we can also calculate some confidence intervals here to think about the variability in our predicted scores. So we're never perfect at predicting and these scores are just estimates, these B values. And so we can think about how much those values vary. Okay. And that might tell me what the true score would be in the population. A good guess anyway. And we're going to practice doing all of that. So for multiple regression, we need two or more independent variables that can be continuous, categorical, whatever we want. One dependent variable that still has to be continuous. So what can we do with multiple regression? Well, we can predict new values for our dependent variables. So I can predict what a student's score would be in organic chemistry one given the number of sessions that they went to and their previous grades. I can determine how much of that variation in the dependent variable. So, you know, how good can I do at predicting people's final scores given that I have this information? So how much of that variance am I getting together? And this to me is an important component. So I'm going to bold this down here. I can tell you how much of their variance I can predict overall, and I can know how uh, much each variable predicts. So I can think about that overall model, my equation. How good is my equation at predicting people's scores? And that would be pretty good. But then once I dig in and I look at each variable, it might turn out that the only thing that's useful is one of them. Okay, this is pretty common where I have, let's say, three or four variables. I'm just going to throw them all in and see what happens. Overall, my model is useful. It predicts. Then when I get down and look at the variables themselves, each of their slopes, I find that only one of them works. And it's carrying the weight of everybody else, just like all of your group projects this semester, right? So you can then look at the contribution of each person to that group project, or in this case, the contribution of each variable to the prediction. Okay, and that's really handy because let's say you have a bunch of variables. You can then sort out which ones are useful and which ones are not. Okay. All right, let's look at some assumptions. A lot of these will be familiar and since at this point in the semester we've covered most of these many times, they're kind of shortened in this list. If you need some more descriptions of what these are, you can go back and look at some of the earlier how-to guides for this section. All right, assumption number one, which has been assumption number one all semester, is that things should be continuous. Okay, that dependent variable really needs to be continuous. The IV can be one or both or a mix of things, um, but our DV has to still be continuous. Okay, so interval or ratio scale. Number two is linearity, which we talked about in our correlation video. It's called linear regression for a reason. So we are assuming that there is this linear relationship. It is not curved. Okay, and we'll look at our outputs to see if it's curved. Uh, no outliers. And so we talked last time about the outliers. 
when you have multiple variables like this, it's important to think about outliers across all of those variables. Okay. As well, we want to make sure we don't have outliers that are way far away from everything else. Okay. The tricky part comes in when we're thinking about outliers whose scores are still in line with the rest of the data, but they're kind of far away, so they um, don't really affect the equation versus outliers who are way far away from everyone else on everything, who would help, uh, affect our prediction. Okay. Last but not least, now we have to deal with this residuals thing. And we've actually been dealing with it all term, we just haven't really called it these names. Okay, So assumption four is called independence of errors or independence of the residuals. We kind of talked about this before when we talked about independent T and, D and uh, between subjects ANOVA. And this idea is that my scores are only tied to me and your scores are only tied to you. If that's not true, there's a correlation between our error. If my score and your score are related, the prediction of them is related. And so the error, how much we're off, is related. And we don't want that. We want to be able to predict each person by themselves. Okay. So we need independence or independence of errors. We talked about homoscedasticity of uh, last time. In correlation, this is a little bit easier because you can just look at X and Y. So as a quick reminder, homoscedasticity is that the spread of X is equal all the way down Y. Okay? Or the other way, the spread of Y is equal all the way down X. But now we might have multiple X's. So that makes it trickier. And so most people think about this as homoscedasticity of the errors. So the error is to be evenly distributed down y. Okay, so when we predict each, um, each of the possible scores of y, we should have the same approximate uh, variance in predicting those scores. So this is still a variance question. So predicting C students should be the same as predicting A students. We shouldn't be way better at one than the other. The residuals are normally distributed. So there's that normal distribution thing again. But now it's about those residuals being normally distributed. And that's an that's a easy one to test, thankfully, because we can just look at a distribution of our errors, not of the data of our errors. Okay. And this allows us to know that there's not some weird prediction going on at one end or another. Okay. And the last but not least, one extra one for multiple regression, when we can't have multicollinearity. Okay. So this is uh, sort of a weird one because it's phrased negative. You don't want multicollinearity. The real name of this is called additivity. You want each item to add something to the equation and you don't want them to be multicollinear. Okay. Multicollinear means uh, correlated. So this is only on the predictors. You want the IV to be correlated with the DV. That's the entire point of regression. But what we don't want is two IVs that are highly correlated predicting the DV. Because then you're wasting your time. If you have two variables that are pretty much the same predicting the DV, why are you using both of them? Just pick one. Okay. And so this creates a power problem. It also can give you some problems with the math of regression. Okay. So, um... These extra assumptions sort of allow us to think about the accuracy of our predictions. We can think about how well our model fits the data, how, how much variation there is in the variables, and test our hypotheses. Okay. It is not uncommon for one or more of these to, to go bust, okay. especially homoscedasticity for reasons, uh, lots of different reasons. But often maybe there's another variable that's predictive that you just don't have that can create these kind of weird shapes in the data. Um, so it's not super unusual for you to, to note in your report, like, well, wasn't quite normal, wasn't quite homoscedastic, but here it is. So we always still wanna tell people what happened with our assumptions, even if they aren't perfect. All right, so from here, I'm gonna cover a simple linear regression. We're going to take pause, make video part two to do multiple regressions so this doesn't get into the hour range. Okay. All right, for hypothesis testing, okay, there's a couple of ways to think about hypothesis testing in regression. 
Um, but for simple linear regression, two of these items are the same. Okay. So if you're asked to state the hypothesis, um, generally it's kind of in this combination where the null hypothesis is that the slope is zero. It doesn't predict. So this maps on to what you did for correlation where the null hypothesis was that rho or the correlation in the population is, is nothing. There's nothing there. Okay. We could pick a different number, but generally people stick with zero and that's what the output from JASP is going to tell us. The alternative hypothesis is that it's not zero. There is a predictive value. You know, I don't know how big it is or how important it is, but there is some sort of predictive value. When you get into having multiple predictors, this might be multiple hypotheses because you have one for predictor number one, one for predictor number two, etc. And then in multiple regression, we also might have a hypothesis that the equation is better than nothing. Okay, so the entire set of predictors are greater than zero. Okay. And what that means is just that we can predict y. So our um, r squared, our predictive value is better than nothing. Okay. Now, to kind of um, help link simple linear regression and um, correlation together is we're going to do the exact same example. So this is the data set from the correlation lecture where we're trying to see if uh, sitting around and watching TV, and if you listen to that video, I said sitting on the TV because it was early in the morning. <laughs> um, yes, 1030 is early for me. So uh, here sitting around watching TV might increase our cholesterol. And this time we're gonna pick a direction for that prediction where we're gonna say that um, uh, the sitting and watching predicts the cholesterol. All right, so let's pick that correlation data again, and this time do a simple linear regression. So I open the hamburger icon here, click open, uh, computer updated guides, and pick correlation. Okay. This regression data, I think is the, uh, the larger one, yeah. So we're gonna use this one for our multiple data. So let's stick with correlation right now. Okay. All right, now we've checked these assumptions before, but let us do it in a slightly new way here. First question, is the data interval ratio? Yep. Second question, is there a linear relationship between the variables? Can do, so let's run our descriptive statistics and get this plot again to determine. So in simple regression, you can use this plot. In multiple regression, we have to um, use some extra plots. So let's go descriptives, descriptives, move both of them over, plots, correlation plots, and that will give us <clears throat> our, our uh, correlation plot and density diagrams does seem to be a little bit more stretched out than before. So this one gave us a, a wider range of the data, whereas this one seems to have stretched. So it's only 155 to 185. Okay. Uh, it's the same graph, so I don't think I did anything weird to it. So here's the original plot. Okay. So is this a linear relationship? Does it bend? Okay, is there a curve in it? No. So it is linear because there's no curves. All right. Now, in our case, this just re-explains it. It's the same thing we had before. So visual inspection of the scatter plot suggests this is linear. That relationship is positive. So as TV time increases, cholesterol is also increasing. Now, this is in our order of prediction, right? Well, we might, oh, that's what I did. I put them in in different orders. No. I don't know what I did different to get a slightly different plot. But anyway, we are probably going to put TV on the y-axis. But it's okay if you flip them for right now because we just want to make sure it isn't curved. And it'll be curved in either direction if you flip x and y. All right. Are there any outliers in the sample? Well, uh, we can just look at our graph. 
And remember in the in the correlation lecture, it's got um, some pictures of what outliers might look like, and they just don't fit the rest of the data points. Okay. So here, what we are in our stretched out sort of diagram, let's make this bigger. Um, we don't see. Ooh, I made it angry. Back up. There we go. We don't really see any outliers, right? So I'm trying to make this just a little bit bigger for the screen. But most of the data is pretty tightly clustered. So if I had somebody like way over here or somebody way over here, that would be an outlier. Or I can have an outlier where it's somebody here in the super high cholesterol range. Okay. But they would be in line with the rest of the data. So I'd have to think about whether or not I wanted to exclude them. We generally like to exclude people who have what's called leverage. Think of leverage like jacking up your car, right? You have to get a, a lever out <laughs> like a jack and help you push up a very heavy object. If we think of the slope here as, as that lever, okay, um, anybody who's up here is gonna pull the slope up. And those are people that we would want to maybe exclude because they are far away from everyone else and they're significantly changing the slope of the data. It might be real data, they just might be in a, a unique individual. The other thing we can do is look at our histograms that we've been looking at all semester and see if there's a big break in our plot where people's data is. I personally like to look at the scatter plots because that gives me an idea of how weird their score is on multiple variables rather than just one. All right, so if our errors are just a typo, you should fix the typo. If our errors are instead um, something that's out of range or an, what I've often called an accuracy problem, where you're not sure what the typo is, you should probably uh, exclude them. And then if you decide, well, it's not really either of these, and so should I include it because this is a real participant with a real score, or should I exclude it because they're really very different from everyone else and talk about how they're very different from everyone else? Both pathways are correct. You should just write that up when you include your write-up. So if I decide to keep the outlier, I could modify them by replacing the outlier with one that's less extreme. I would say that this is um, less common than it used to be in statistics transform the dependent variable, or just do the analysis and highlight the outlier in your report. Yes, I know, I have a meeting soon. <laughs> um, I would, I, personal opinion is the third one is the best, because once we start transforming the scores, they no longer represent that actual participant. Okay? And then transforms of the DV are, are common in some areas and not others, but then it becomes difficult to interpret the analysis. Okay. So you gotta really think about what you wanna do. I usually try to do number three. Okay. And what I actually do in reports, if I can, is take uh, remove the outlier and keep the outlier and present both. Okay. Over the many years of doing this, um, we used to just remove them <laughs> and just be like, see you later. But now I would probably report both. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Transformations can also give you problems with uh, homoscedasticity um, and normality. Okay, so you have to be careful there. We could remove the outlier and just say, hey, we remove this outlier. They don't really fit with everybody else. Okay. So let's see here. Um, one more question you can ask about yourself, ask about yourself, <laughs> ask yourself is whether um, uh, that person is representative of who you're trying to study, basically. If we um, are studying cholesterol, this like high score of eight is like very high. And is that really who I wanted to study? Um, or does that person not represent who we're trying to generalize to? And so this happens to us in studies where I work with clinical folks and they're trying to study like normal ranges of student anxiety, right? Students have a lot of anxiety, you're doing a lot of stuff, you got a lot of pressure, it's got a lot of stuff going on, right? And um, somebody who has a diagnosed anxiety disorder may not be someone you wanna study. So their data is kind of far away from everyone else. 
And often those people get excluded because they don't really represent the normal college student, so to speak. Okay. Um, and so that might be a way to remove them. Okay. Now to do the rest, we're going to do something new. Okay, this is going to be running the regression analysis. So we're going to click regression, regression. Okay. So let's do that. Regression, linear regression here. Our dependent variable is cholesterol. Our covariates here is time. And be sure you leave this as enter. There's a couple of other options here, but leave it as enter. Okay. We're now doing stepwise regression. Under assumptions checks, let's pick some boxes. Residuals versus predicted. Residuals histogram give us the standardized ones and the QQ plot. So, oh, where did the assumptions box go? Okay. Well, that's new. So maybe it's here under options, statistics, model, plots. There it is. Okay, it's under plots instead of assumptions. So I'll fix that in our, our um, guide here in a minute. So we got residuals versus predicted, residual histogram, and QQ plot. So I've just changed the name of what this box is. So those three. And that's going to bring us a bunch of stuff down here, which we're going to talk about one at a time. Are those residuals normally distributed? Excellent. You're going to get a plot histogram that says standardized residuals, and I'm going to look at it. Right? And what we want is a normal distribution. This one here is like a little bivariate, okay? or bimodal rather. It's got kind of two humps. And so what I always tell students to do in this part, the reason that we standardize this is to make it easy to interpret. Okay. You generally want to see the data centered over zero, generally between two and two, so negative two and two. Okay. So we want this to be a bell curve. Okay. And mostly this is normal. This, here, this little missing spot is not great, but this is generally pretty normal. Other thing you can do is look at a QQ plot. Now I always use this QQ plot for linearity. Okay, so what we've got here is the quantile that the residual should fit in, the actual residual, and you want them to line up like little um, marching soldiers on a line here. Okay. You always want to be nice to this plot outside of two, because okay. it's really hard to predict scores that are two Z scores away from the mean. So no Z scores were probably a long time ago, but remember that two Z scores out is a very small probability. Okay. So we want our little dots to line up on the line here. Okay. And if they're they're normal and linear, they usually will. Okay. So the part the, they're not perfectly aligned, but they're pretty close. And this is fairly robust to those violations, just like ANOVA, because remember ANOVA is just a special type of regression. So same type of protection we've got here. And so we've already kind of taken linearity by looking at the graph, but we can also use this, um, this QQ plot for that and normality, right? So if they're normal, they kind of line up on the line. What about homoscedasticity? So homoscedasticity, right? We've included a little, another little plot to help remind you is that the spread of X and the spread of Y are even. Um, so if we draw a little square around the uh, dots here, we see that we get this sort of rectangle shape versus this one, which is bad, which is a triangle shape. So no Doritos, no megaphones, no weird shapes, just blobs. Okay. Now, the cool thing about doing this as a regression is that we get this nice plot. Okay. So this one's a little bit more spread out. Make sure it didn't give us anything weird. So I don't... This one's a little different, so we'll update that. Copy. I don't know why it's different, it's the same data. Yes, do it. Give me access. So if you're on a Mac, just a quick reminder. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So <clears throat> again, we have this standardized residuals side. So this is our Z scores. And you'll notice that everything seems to be pretty evenly distributed around zero. Okay, and then we have our predicted scores down here. In a perfect world, I also like to standardize these so that everything is like zero centered. But generally we want the spread of X to be even down Y. Okay. 
way. Now these are not x and y anymore, they've been transformed, but we have the same idea, we want the spread to be even. Okay. Now the spread is not so even here, um, it's not perfect, so let's draw some little lines on it. Um, show you what I mean here. Get some little lines. So if I draw some shapes here, give me another one, draw a line around the dots, these are not perfect. Cut me some, some line drawn slack here. Okay. You'll notice that this is not evenly distributed. Okay. On this graph, we want this to be a square this way. Okay. On the other graphs, when we actually have x, real x and y, it's okay if the square, you want the square to be um, tilted with a regression, with a slope. Okay. In this particular graph, this is no longer x and y. This is x and the residuals. And we want that to be spread as a rectangle left to right. So you want regular rectangles, not, uh, what is this, a rhombus? Okay. So we'd prefer the data be square like this. Okay. And not, let's see if we can make this clear on the inside or not so solid. Ah, transparency, yeah. You'd prefer the data be square this way and not the interior square. So we're missing these little triangle corners here. And what that implies is that it's maybe not perfectly homoscedastic. I need a little bit of heteroscedasticity here because there's no dots in these other little regions. So let's now do the test here. So let's click a few more boxes. Hopefully they're labeled the same thing. Statistics here, great. We want to think about our outliers. So this actually has a built-in test for outliers. So we're going to click on um, uh, Durbin Watson and Casewise Diagnostics here. If I can find it, boop, boop. Okay, we're going to use standard residual of greater than three. Um, so that is a change. So I'll update that picture. And we want to see if we have independence of observations. Okay, this is the, the model summary test here. Where did it go? A model summary test here, which has got the Durbin Watson on the outside. Okay. And the statistic here, so let me um, copy this new form of this graph. This is a little different. Okay. So it's gonna give us um, the statistic is what we're interested in here, right? But it also gives us a p-value, so that's a, a new update to JASP. They just be updating stuff left and right here. I can't keep up. All right, so we're interested here. And the statistic here is approximately 1.916, which means um, it's probably okay. So it ranges from zero to four, and you're looking for values hovering around two, which indicates there's no correlation between the residuals. So it's called autocorrelation here, meaning the relationship between the residuals is not is is more than zero. Okay, um, our value is pretty close to two, two, so we're gonna say yeah, this probably meets that assumption. Okay. Now outliers can really affect a statistical analysis. Um, I was trying to figure out what was wrong with this word earlier because I was like, it's not spelled correctly, skedasticity. There it is. Um, I'll fix it above. Um, <clears throat> so outliers can have a big effect on a regression. Uh, they can cause problems with normality or homoscedasticity, which uh, reduces our ability to predict. Okay. And so we can actually look at our plots, which we did earlier, to visually sort of inspect for outliers, or you can use these case-wise diagnostics. Okay, so let's go look for that. And it's still empty here. So we'll just copy the new one here, make sure it's not changed. Okay. It's got a little bit more in the plot, but it hasn't really changed a whole lot. It's got one of my new one of my favorites in here called Cook's Distance. Okay. So in this particular case, we don't have an outlier, but, and the table's blank. Okay. In, uh, if the data was an outlier, here's what it might look like with also with Cook's distance. Okay. 
If you have an, ex an outlier, we could see this is case number 10. Just as a quick reminder, that means that this is row number 10 in the data. Okay, so case number here is row number. And that says, well, they have a really high standardized residual. Okay, the standardized residual, oh, you generally, this is gonna pick something over the three. Yeah, standardized residuals greater than three. Okay, and what that means is that, that our ability to predict them is three Z scores away. That's not good. Okay, that's really bad. Um, then it tells us their actual cholesterol our predicted ability for that cholesterol and then the residual. Okay, that's not the standardized residual. Um, this is the standardized one. The, the difference, this is mathematically just subtract. Okay. And so we can use that information to decide if we want to include them or exclude them. Okay. So this is much better than the eyeball test, although I bet this will match what you find using the eyeball test and looking at a scatter plot. Um, but these are very helpful when you have more than two variables and so you can't scatter plot them all together basically So instead what we do is rely on these case-wise diagnostics okay. So we can run the analysis with and without those people All right, everyone I'm back from my meeting. So let's continue hopefully for you. This is a small jump uh, understanding what we were doing so we were looking at the um, outlier analysis, let's now get into understanding the real analysis. Okay. So in our JASP window here, we have our model summary on ANOVA and then a coefficients box. So let's talk about each of those one at a time. Okay. The model summary box provides information to understand how well that model fits the data. So this will tell us like overall, how good are we doing? Big R here is the multiple correlation coefficient. Co <laughs> the multiple correlation coefficient. If you remember from our correlation lecture, the correlation between time TV spent watching TV and cholesterol was 0.371. So do notice here how simple linear regression relates to correlation. Okay. R squared here is the uh, variance accounted for, so about 14%, which is what we found before. There's an adjusted value, a, um, a, a REMC value, which we're mostly going to ignore for our purposes, and mostly focus is going to be here on R squared. Okay, this is a moderate correlation, and we're really interested in the proportion of variance accounted for. Okay, so this is approximately 14% of the variance in cholesterol can be accounted for by time spent watching TV. Okay. All right. The uh, ANOVA table, which is the second one down, gives me the statistical test for this. So is 14% better than zero? Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Okay. And we can interpret this much in the same way we did our original ANOVA. Okay, so we got F here. So here's our report rate. So um, the model is statistically significant because P is less than alpha, and we might report it in this way. Okay. When I report this for APA though, I would explain what that means. Our predictors, um, or our model fit the data, or the model was better than chance, that kind of thing. Uh, and you'll see an example below. So F here indicates that we are doing an F test still. This isn't, um, remember that, that ANOVA ANOVA is a special type of regression, so it's still an F test. Uh, one in 198 is our regression degrees of freedom. Okay. The 98 and the one in 98 is the residual degrees of freedom. Sometimes this is called error. 15.64 is our ANOVA. Again, I'm really bad at the do not disturb thing today. So let me <laughs> close that window so it doesn't keep beeping at us. And our p-value here is the probability of attaining our f, you know, if the null is true. Okay. So that tells me, this here, tells me the overall model is significant. Okay. In a multiple regression scenario, this is useful because then it tells me that at least one of these variables is predictive. What's well, a simple linear regression, it's the only one we have, right? So we come down here and look at the coefficients box to kind of understand what's happening. Okay. 
So our general equation here is going to be cholesterol. This is y. It's predicted by the intercept okay, plus our slope times TV, okay, where b0 is the intercept, b1 is the coefficient. So we can fill in that formula here with our unstandardized coefficients. So negative 1.1 plus 0.038 times TV. And let's say your instructor's like, what's the score for someone's cholesterol if they watch three hours of TV a day? Then what you do is fill in your formula and just plug and chug on your calculator. Right? You're gonna end up with about six cholesterol points. Um, other things I can look at here are the standardized coefficients. This is sometimes called beta. And notice here how it's 3.71, or 3.371. Okay. When you have a simple linear regression, correl the correlation coefficient r, beta, um, r, and then r, big R are all the same thing. Okay. Because correlation is a special case of simple linear regression. This is a t-test, and it gives you that t-value, and that t-value will not perfectly match our f-score, but they're related to each other. So let me show you how here. We're going to take 15.64, take the square root, boop, boop. we'll get 3.95, and you should see here that that matches our value. So t-squared is f. So in this case, we get the same result from our overall model test as we do our coefficient because we only have one coefficient. Okay. When there's multiple variables and this is multiple regression, those two things won't be the same anymore. But when the case there's only one, these things kind of match. They don't kind of match, they do match. Okay. And so here we can show that the B value, the slope is 0.04. What does that mean? For every one unit increase in X, so for every minute of TV, our cholesterol level increases 0.04. Now the intercept here is negative, and that implies that um, what's happening is that the slope is high enough here that we have to, that if X were truly zero, okay, so if X, if we never watched a lick of TV, our cholesterol level is actually low. Now, cholesterol obviously cannot be zero, but because of the way our equation is working, at, um, if it could be, right, if time could be zero, which it's not in this equation, uh, our cholesterol might be negative. Okay. In reality, that doesn't happen. All right, so let's report all of that together, and then we'll take a break from this video because it's getting kind of long, and, and do a multiple regression in part two. So reporting this all together, remember the rules. First, tell me about the study. A linear regression established that time spent watching TV could statistically significantly, blah, 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 could predict, okay, let's just say significantly predict cholesterol. So I've told you about the study, and then now I've told you about the test, and I've left something out. Okay, where are my assumptions? So let's add that right now. Uh, linear regression established that time spent watching TV could significantly predict cholesterol and it um, accounted for 13.8% of the variability. Let's also add here uh, the assumptions of independence, normality, linearity, and homogeneity, oh no no no, homoscedasticity were assessed and found to be met with small amount, with a, let's say here, with a small amount of heteroskedasticity. Whew, spelling, okay. So we still wanna talk about those assumptions. No outliers were found. Okay. Then we could also predict, put in the, the equation, okay? because otherwise we haven't told people what the slope is. Okay? So you always want to tell people the overall effect and the actual slopes. Okay? But we do want to talk about our assumptions. Now if you want to include the Durbin-Watson statistic, you can. I don't know if I've ever seen anybody do that. 
Um, and now it actually comes with a p-value, although that's pretty new to me. I've always just seen the number itself. Um, so we could say independence and then put Durbin Watson equals 1.92. Okay, we didn't find any outliers looking at standardized residuals, so we could expand this to tell people how we looked for these things. But you should at least minimally mention that you looked for them. Okay. So I'm going to stop here and save this file. Uh, you should, if you need multiple regression, watch the next video because it will continue on.